I'm here today with Rabbi Steve Greenberg, who is the founding director of Eshel, a support education and advocacy organization for LGBTQ Orthodox Jews and their families. He's the author of the groundbreaking book, Wrestling with God and Men, Homosexuality in the Jewish Tradition, which won the Koretz Book Award for Philosophy and Thought. Steve currently lives with his husband, Stephen Goldstein, and daughter, Amalia, in Boston. Rabbi Greenberg, thank you for making time. My pleasure, Shmuley. So to jump right in, how have you seen Orthodox perspectives on LGBTQ issues evolve over the last few decades? Um, and where have we seen more progress and where less? Uh, so it should surprise nobody that, um, that this has been a, a, a work in progress over the past 20 years. Um, I, I imagine that a piece of the story is, is that the larger context in which this is sitting is changed as well. Um, American attitudes have shifted in, in, in it certainly more dramatically in the last five to 10 years. So um, I, I guess functionally I would say um, that it's hard to find a rabbi that is not empathetic, at least in theory. In other words, if when we did our survey of rabbis, We've interviewed about 160 synagogue rabbis. Um, what we discovered was that nearly 90% claimed to under, be understanding and sympathetic to the plight of, of individual uh, gay and lesbian people. I would say that the trans issue and the bisexual issue were more complicated for rabbis. The other thing we discovered is, is that um, rabbis are much more comfortable with individual gay and lesbian people than they are when when couples appear and certainly when couples and children appear um, that uh, ends up becoming a much more complicated affair having to do with a kind of experiential legitimacy or i would say normalization of the reality of lgbt identity and the last thing i want to say is is that is that because so many people have come out and because there's a newfound capacity for lgbt people to stay orthodox i think that initially the choice was stay silent or leave and speak out and be who you are. And now this new, I think really fairly recent reality of people attempting um, in part or in whole to stay in Orthodox communities is shifting the approach. And, and now uh, we did a survey of parents and discovered that 90% of our parents want their kids to find a life partner. 90% of our Orthodox parents want their kids to find a life partner as opposed to remaining celibate. And nearly 65% really want there to be staff training in schools for LGBT issues. So the, the, the needle is moving and it's moving largely for two reasons. One is the circumstances changing and people are coming out and Orthodox institutions and leadership are having to respond to human beings and not to an issue. Yeah, amazing, amazing. I wonder, do, do you think Torah has anything uniquely positive to contribute to the world in regards to LGBTQ inclusion and actualization? I guess there's two populations to think about there. One, sort of the Jewish secular worldview. Does Torah have something to offer? And then to the broader world outside of the Jewish world, do we have something to contribute? Um, so I think it's a complex question only because I think that we and, and others um, might point to the Torah as, as the source of the most con, you know, condemning um, resources for same-sex male intimacy. Um, so whatever I could say that we offer has to be looked upon in the backdrop of the reality that there's uh, historical neg negativity that might make you know, whatever I'd say seem kind of tangential. On the other hand, Jews have the capacity to kind of find resources that are old and see them in new light when the challenges appear. I would say that um, the fact that the image of God is, is neither male nor female and that Chazal even point to this reality that the first human being was an androgynous, therefore kind of God, because God's androgynous, God's not male or female or beyond gender even. So the very notion that gender is not embedded in that way in, in, in the creation story, I think makes a difference. It's good that, that the Torah begins with this notion of human loneliness as being the problem that needs to be solved and gender as the response to that. 
Um, I would just say that, you know, bottom line, the commitment of the tradition, not merely to dyadic and intimate partnership as a tool for reproduction, but as a, a frame for a human flourishing, um, as a kind of fundamental reality of learning about what it is to be human, um, is pretty strong so that we don't require uh, reproduction in marriage even. It's, it's certainly a mitzvah to fulfill, but if impossible to fulfill, marriage is still and, and, you know, obligatory and desirable. I think that's very helpful. Um, there's more to say, but, um, you know, uh, <laughs> there's a 300 and, you know, 50 page book that I wrote that has some of that in there. And I'm sure that, you know, maybe at some point we can uh, delve more deeply, but I, I would say bottom line, I would say the Torah offers potential realities that can address this question of yet, yet been fully employed. Great. If you haven't checked out that book yet, make sure to check it out, Wrestling with God and Men. So my last question for you is, what do you think are the most meaningful models for Orthodox same-sex marriage ceremonies? I know this is a relatively recent phenomenon and, and growing. Um, and um, what are some of the possible models and what do you think is, can be most meaningful? Well, uh, you know, I, I hesitated to do same-sex commitment ceremonies or weddings, you might call them, um, for more than a decade. Um, until I, uh, I returned from India with my newborn daughter and um, planning for her birth and then bringing her home and giving her a name in an Orthodox congregation just pushed me over the edge. And I said to myself, you know, I can't offer a future to young people who discover themselves to be gay and lesbian if it doesn't include celebrating love and companionship and the possibility of building a family. So I did a commitment ceremony. Um, I based it upon work that Rachel Adler had begun, but I didn't think she finished it. So that the ceremony is, is comprised of two parts, a shutafut or a star shutafut, which is essentially creating a partnership that would be parallel to a business partnership, but instead of a business, you're creating a household. And then in order to make it exclusive and intimate, a set of nidarim or uh, oaths of various kinds to focus uh, the couple on their loyalty to each other and an intimacy that isn't shared more broadly. And, um, and then to finish it with, um, with you know, various blessings that might be considered um, similar to uh, the Sheva Brachot that celebrate the love of two and the, and the creation of a household um, in the, you know, uh, in the community of Israel. Um, I, I think that some, something on those lines um, will, all, will, it has already happened. I mean, I did um, a wedding for a Riverdale couple, both Orthodox uh, or traditionally trained young men. Um, and a year later, they have two infants they're raising. Um, and, and the whole Riverdale community came up. In other words, it is the, the form of life that is actually on the table in these scenarios. And the choice of gender ends up becoming relatively small um, in the, or the, or the reality of different gender pairings. It's, it ends up becoming not so much the, uh, the central concern. The concern is, um, you know, are these people committed to being part of a historical chain and do they want to, um, participate in a living Jewish community. Right, amazing, amazing. Well, friends, make sure to follow and support Eshel's work um, on Facebook and you get their website and their, and their email group. Um, if you are an observant Jew who is a part of the LGBTQ community, you can plug in. If you are a family member or friend of someone, you can plug in. They have programs to support the parents uh, of children and many other things. Uh, Steve, thanks for your time. Can I end with one thought? Great, please do. Okay. So, according to Hillel, the whole Torah is summed up in, you know, um, what, what, your, what your friend finds hateful, what you find hateful, don't do to your friend. Or, or a form of a kamocha, love thy neighbor as yourself. The hallmark, according to the Rambam, of love is knowing what you need 
and ensuring that others have it. So I guess what I'd like to suggest is, is that um, anyone who cherishes the ability to give and receive lifelong love with a partner that one is deeply committed to um, and to be chastened by that love and challenged by that love, enriched and deepened and comforted by that intimate friend, anyone who wants that for themselves ought to commit to loving their neighbors thyself and making sure that all their children have that opportunity. Mm, love it. Amazing. So I, we, we, we might have a halachic responsibility or a Jewish ethical responsibility, if that's something different, um, or at least an existential responsibility to fulfill that mandate that was just mentioned. Um, it runs at the core of who we are as human beings and our human needs. Amazing. So inspiring. And uh, we wish you so much success in all your work. Thank you, Shmuley. Thank you.